Hi, and welcome to day two of the Jumpstart program. I want to welcome everybody here, um, those of you who were here yesterday and those of you who are um, joining us for the first time. I'm super excited that this program is welcoming both Plymouth State faculty and staff, but also faculty and staff from our other USNH institutions. And we really had kind of a nice even mix of people from all over the state yesterday. So it's a great opportunity for us to start to get to know each other's names and faces a little bit. And maybe in some of the subsequent programming we do, we can have more of a chance to actually talk with each other. Um, most of the Jumpstart programs are designed to be a little bit more presentational. Um, although you uh, can find, I think, some entry points for chit chat, particularly if you stick around for the optional um, 1030 to 1130 debriefing this morning when there's more opportunity for us to talk. So for those of you who are new to uh, Jumpstart today, I just want to make sure that you know where you can find um, the Jumpstart website. I just put that in the chat. It's got the whole schedule for the week. Basically from 9 to 9.30, we do a, a collab sponsored um, quick sort of fast blast program, um, followed by our featured speaker from 9.30 to 10.30, and an optional chit chat debrief from 10.30 to 11. Uh, later in the afternoon at three o'clock, we have drop-in hours for PSU faculty and staff who might need help um, from collab staff on course design. There's also um, some tech workshops and extra stuff uh, peppered throughout, um, including one coming up on Canvas on Wednesday. So keep an eye out for that. All right, so this morning, um, I am really happy to welcome our colleague, uh, Nicholas Helms, who is in the English department at Plymouth State, a new faculty member. Um, and I've gotten to know Nick well over the year and even a little bit before he came, he's a pretty um, active disability activist on Twitter and I've watched his work there and particularly informed by some of his work in the disability community. He's been writing some really interesting things lately about um, fatigue, self-care um, and faculty and staff, um, uh, mental health and, and wellness during COVID. And as a result of some of those readings that I was looking through that he's been doing, we invited him here today to talk to you about the ever present issue of um, fatigue as we look ahead to spring. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over for this half hour to Nick. Thank you, Robin, for that very generous introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, if I don't look fatigued right now, it's 100% because of coffee, that's it, um, and nerves. Uh, so I'm going to drop in the chat one more time. This is the sharing link for the slides that I am about to uh, share screen with. Da, 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 da. Always the fun part of 2020 is the awkward tech moments. Um, okay. And... Hang on. Just realized that that is, I'm not gonna be able to do uh, captions if I open that in Firefox, I need it in Chrome. Happens to me every time. Um, yep. As we're doing that, I also wanna let folks know that we are um, recording and posting this stuff. So depending on how live captions go, um, another thing you can always do is catch it in the replay where eventually we will make sure the captions are well edited and um, those will be posted for all of our events on our website. Yep, and I will say for accessibility reasons, um, I, I was always told in grad school, like never read from the slide, that's boring. Um, but then uh, in, in the past five years or so, I've realized that, that no, read from the slides, that's an accessibility issue. Um, so if you don't want the, that in duplicate, there's a nice little slide bar on Teams, I believe, where you can reduce the size of the share screen and just have my face really large. So feel free to do that. Um, captions on, notes for me. All right. So, um, avoiding spring 2021, the fatiguing. Um, 
As the fall semester winds up to a frenzied deadline punctuation crescendo, and as U.S. COVID-19 cases experience a similar spike, both in numbers and in corresponding anxiety, the prospect of a winter break from classes seems less like a rest and more like a collectively held breath before the plunge into tw spring 2021. We've known for a while that we should plan for fatigue during this global pandemic. Uh, students, teachers, and disability justice activists have been prophesying the dangers of fatigue for months. In particular, Amy Hamre has been beating the drum about opposing capitalist norms of productivity and slowing down teaching. Uh, Hamre writes, I recognize in my own life and in my activism the value of and concept of sustainability that comes from the disability justice movement. Sustainability is about being honest about our capacity and where we're at, about honoring the limitations that we may face in terms of time, energy, and just being alive in a time of a pandemic and in capitalism. The pandemic is winding up for a long winter, and we must reckon with the fact that COVID-19 will be with us through 2021 at least and perhaps longer. Um, we can no longer pretend to push through our fatigue. Instead, we must find ways to live and work in fatiguing times. And just to go off script for a second, I was listening to, um, uh, I believe, yesterday's episode of the Daily Podcast from New York Times, and they were talking about the, the um, expected timelines for vaccinations coming out uh, in the spring. And while essential workers, which may in some states include educators, are likely in January, many of our students will may not see vaccines until May. So um, uh, my, expect my personal expectations are that uh, we're gonna see campus, um, uh, ca campus situations much like we saw in the fall. Um, and with the mounting fatigue that we already had, that sort of debt of fatigue, uh, that's just going to, uh, I, that's not gonna be well mitigated by the winter break. We've got to plan for it. We've got to plan around it. Um, so today's presentation is drawn from an essay in progress I'm co-authoring with Kate Kirby, a PhD student at Vanderbilt, and Asia Merrill, a current English major at Plymouth State. Um, together, we argue that we must find ways to live and work in fatiguing times. Um, this, this talk is really like one-third polemic, one-third utopian vision, and one-third practical tips. Um, so some of the uh, uh, utopian vision. Uh, we, we need to proactively construct our courses and semesters to mitigate fatigue rather than contribute to it. Fatigue is a disability justice issue because it drains the time and energy disabled people need to care for themselves and their communities. Fatigue is a student retention and success issue because it chips away at students' capacity to learn and to manage their time. And finally, fatigue is a labor issue for students, faculty, and staff because the current public health conditions under COVID-19 multiply the already backbreaking work of higher education into an untenable cycle of impossible expectations and burnout. Let me just underline that point once again. We are already at a horrific state of overwork and of um, capitalist productivity before COVID-19. COVID-19 hasn't changed things so much as it has like tipped them over the edge. Um, and we have a tremendous opportunity this year and next to learn from uh, these disasters and to design better, uh, better workplaces, better classrooms, uh, better lives. Um, but uh, it's not simply about returning to normal because normal was pretty damn broken already. Um, so this next section is taken from uh, Kate's section in the essay. So I'm, I'm, I'm ventriloquizing Kate. Uh, so uh, it's, it's subtitled Teaching to Crip Time, Promoting Student Investment Through Choice in Activity Content in a Quantity. Um, uh, Kate Kirby is a PhD candidate in biological sciences at Vanderbilt, uh, where she studies mitochondrial DNA and C. elegans, which I do not understand what any of that means other than uh, wow, is Kate uh, smart. Um, she also serves as a teaching affiliate at the Vanderbilt Center for Teaching, where she focuses on access and equity in the classroom, the lab, and the academy at large. Kate's experience with chronic illness informs her teaching and classroom policies. If you saw some viral Twitter threads from about uh, June, July, August that were like, uh, they were uh, twines. They were choose your own adventure stories about going back to campus under COVID-19 situations. That's Kate Kirby. Those are hers. Um, 
In her book, Feminist Career Quip, uh, Feminist Career Quip, Alison Kafer describes the concept of crip time as a combination of a flexible standard for punctuality and the extra time needed to arrive or accomplish something embraced by many in the disability community. Disabled people often build in extra time for activities and disabled scholars are no different. Christine Miserandino popularized the concept of spoon theory, which suggests that activities require energy, spoons, uh, how many spoons you have in the drawer that day, and that individuals with limited energy due to chronic illness must make choices and carefully plan based on the limited number of spoons they have. While these aren't terms that non-disabled people can simply appropriate for their own lives, these concepts do articulate ways of being and thinking in the world that everyone can benefit from. So uh, what I'm terming universal design for fatigue. So ways to build lack of time and lack of available effort into your course. Um, since student investment can promote engagement, we can provide choice in activities or assignments. Um, by encouraging students to complete only part of the assignments, it normalizes the idea that work is always in progress. So if you offer uh, a, a, um, a, a buffet or a smorgasbord of options of which students need to choose X amount rather than the total amount that plays to student choice um, and also gestures to the larger idea that the ongoing nature of scholarly work is always important to consider, but it's crucial in the current climate that this work doesn't stop once the class is over with. Um, um, so uh, let, me, let, me, let me just back up and um, and uh, riff on uh, Kate Kirby's ideas for a second. So um, Kate Kirby is mostly on about the idea that everyone can learn from the way disabled people and people with chronic illnesses are dealing with time, managing, with managing time, dealing with fatigue and understanding life and your week, not as about how many productive work hours you can have, but as about um, uh, what you want out of life and what you can do with the energy and the time that you have um, and then ap applying that to the classroom. Uh, the next section in this uh, work in progress and in this presentation is from Asia Merrill, uh, who writes on respecting students' time and work schedule. Asia is a senior undergraduate student at Plymouth State University. She's an English major and a Spanish minor. Asia shares her experiences as a typical student during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, and while it's not in here, uh, uh, in the larger version, uh, Asia Merrill talks about having at any given time during the semester, three to four jobs or side gigs going on on top of being a full-time student. Um, so that's, that's Asia's perspective. Um, in particular, Asia says, as a middle-class, mostly independent student, I can say that the next semester must be met with compassion from both professors and administration, or else higher, higher education risks the academic downfall and worse, the mental health of their students. One of the ways accommodations were incorporated this semester was through a combination of ungrading policies and high-flex education. And for the sake of time, I'm gonna focus on her thoughts on ungrading. So this semester has provided opportunities for professors to practice ungrading policies. It seems based on um, my group of colleagues, my, my close group of colleagues, and also just sort of the academic Twitter that a lot of people are moving towards ungrading to provide additional flexibility and transparency to students. Um, a large portion of the rigidity in the average syllabus is unnecessary at best and ableist at worst, and ungrading can begin to address that worst. So ungrading, prioritizes student self-evaluation and metacognition over traditional grading schemas, sometimes by eliminating grading altogether. It removes gray areas and personal bias by assessing whether the work meets the requirements rather than a nebulous degree of quality. And when paired with relaxed deadlines, ungrading lets students better manage their own time. Even with only one class with ungrading on the syllabus, students can find ways to redistribute the academic weight throughout the work week and prevent burnout. Um, so speaking of her own experience, Asia writes, while experiencing this type of framework for the first time, I found freedom to explore coursework on my own terms. And I felt that the priority shifted from deadlines to intellectual growth. I was able to draw real applicable connections between racial justice and literature. And I grew as an academic writer through the multiple revision opportunities offered by ungrading. 
many of my peers felt the same and appreciated the relative flexibility. That's not to say that ungrading doesn't come with challenges. For example, students who are used to using numerical grading to understand their success in their courses might resist the idea of classes without a traditional grading structure. Others might struggle with hard, without hard deadlines as those can be a safeguard against procrastination. Uh, the system, uh, the university system could be out of sync uh, or rather the ungrading system could be out of sync with administrations and university systems that still lean on traditional grading styles. Um, I'm seeing that in my own classes where um, we don't have a pass, no pass option this semester at Plymouth like we did in the spring. And I'm coming down to places where students either need an incomplete or need to rush to make up stuff at the end of the semester. And that, that it feels like a point where um, my priorities in ungrading are clashing against the systemic tools that I have on hand. Since many universities still dole out letter grades at the end of the semester, will students be unprepared for such final grades after a semester without any? Uh, so if in, in teaching students and debunking sort of the value of traditional letter grades, um, is that going to create conflict for students in their other, other classes? Is that setting them up to, um, for agitation later on down the line? Um, we would argue that it's possible to mitigate some of these concerns with thoughtful syllabus revisions and active con collaboration with students on a continuum. This could look like firm deadlines, but ones with room for appeal uh, and thoughtful feedback from instructors rather than numbers, which don't offer spe specific recommendations anyway. What does one do with a B? Despite these challenges, ungrading is still a step in the right direction with regard to accessibility and course building. Many faculty have already ingrained accommodations into their classes, but what should happen instead is a full restructuring of syllabi with fatigue in mind. It's not lowering the bar, lowering the bar but removing a barrier. All right, I am, so I'm getting to my section and I'm being conscious of time. So I'm gonna speed forward a little bit more. So uh, I do British literature, I do Shakespeare, I do cognitive science and disability studies. I'm really fascinated by how uh, consistently people misunderstand and misread one another in fiction and in life. Um, we don't, we in this room don't have the collective power to fix fatigue or fix capitalist productivity in higher ed, but there are things we can do in our own work lives, our own work weeks, and our own classes to mitigate the effects and to push against um, the overwhelming workloads that are contributing to pandemic fatigue. Um, so this section is working to the clock for students or the case for a 40 hour school week. Um, so uh, um, if, as the logic of the necroliberal university proclaims, college is primarily job preparation and can be likened to a full-time job, that means that colleges should ask for at most a 40 hour work week from students, right? Uh, if we're doing that, then we're overworking the, those students according to many principles of the labor movement of our own um, uh, administrations, of our own um, uh, admissions uh, programs and advertising about, uh, about the manageability of school. Um, according to my calculations, and these are just really rough calculations, um, so 40 hours a week, don't forget lunch breaks, that leaves about 35 hours per week, 15 credit hours for a full-time student, um, two and a third work hours per credit hour at that rate. Um, for my classes, I teach four credit hour classes, that means 9.3 hours per week. That's four hours of class and, and the, the, you know, the, 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 the buzz work, the conversations in the hallway, hallway before and after class and how those happen in a digital space. So that's five and a third hours of additional week per work for my students outside of class. If I give them more than that, I'm deliberately overworking them. Um, if you give your students more than that, you're deliberately overworking them. You're systemically overworking them, even if it's not con a conscious choice. Um, I really think a 40 hour work week should be seen as the absurd upper limit of what we should expect from our students and by extension ourselves. Um, in a lot of ways, more work for the students means more work for us. Um, and we're inflating the expectations of a course in the name of productivity, professionalization, et cetera, but to the detriment of our students and ourselves and our, uh, our supporting staff. 
there, now there are problems with this model with cal simply calculating work. We're not right now being re-energized by our passions and by social feedback. So things are weighing on us more heavily. Our breaks and weekends are disappearing to public health concerns, pressing activism and increased care work both in and outside of the classroom. Um, COVID-19 demands additional labor where, te where required testing, attendance, seating charts and hybrid classrooms are concerned. And the facade of professorial professionalism requires more and more investment to maintain. I bet every one of us stressed more over, stresses more over being professional in a Zoom environment like this than we do in the average classroom, which isn't to say that um, we dress up more for Zoom. It's to say that the, pr the added pressure of the digital environment weighs on us more. Uh, and then just in general, Zoom fatigue. I am absolutely gonna cut my camera off as soon as this presentation is over because, uh, you know, self-care. Um, and I went the wrong way. Um, I, I'll skip that slide. So uh, well, let me just say on, the, on, the, on that last slide for the sake of time, um, this does not even address things like students working full-time, students working multiple jobs, students facing food and housing insecurity. Uh, the undue burden of white, of white supremacy entangled with capitalist productivity, uh, placing an increased burden on students, faculty, and staff of color. Um, that uh, I'm just ch chipping at a small piece of this I iceberg. But what I'm trying to point out here um, is that we're, we are all collectively setting up certain expectations for the workload of our students, of ourselves, and of our um, uh, uh, of staff members at our institutions. And we're doing that right now in this rush to prepare for the spring. And we can make very conscious choices to scale back, um, have aut to automate our, some of our feedback to students, eliminate disposable style. Uh, assignments, be open with our students about our own fatigue, our own struggles to produce in the time of pandemic. Um, we could build breaks in even when those breaks don't exist in university schedules. Um, short and synchronous class time, recognizing that class, uh, that Zoom does have an extra burden of fatigue. Um, I presented the version of sort of like four hours in class, five hours out. Um, I see no reason during pandemic why you can't have two hours in, seven hours out, um, because that those hours in class are going to weigh more heavily than anything else in the student schedule. Um, and I'd also just suggest basic needs syllabus language for flexible mental health days, building in that expectation and those rules that if students need to just opt out for a day or three because they can't, um, th that's okay and is in fact a priority um, all the time, but especially during a pandemic. Um, ultimately, designing for fatigue it, for, the, for the spring isn't just about COVID-19, isn't just about this academic year. It's about a long overdue reckoning with the toxic ableism of productivity in higher education. It's about breaking down systems that reinforce overwork in order to rebuild our classrooms into communities of access, care, and equity. If we can imagine a post-pandemic campus that nurtures rather than fatigues, we can begin to make such campuses our future now. All right, that's what I've got. Thank you for listening. Um, I'll I'll, uh, I'll drop the screen share. I was thinking and, about the end there when, yeah. you're, when you're talking about like a toxic this and that and you know. Yeah. I'm actually getting like like happy and moved and like, I feel like cheering and standing up. And then I'm like, I bet there's some people who are just like, oh, that's so terrible, you know? But so I, I, I guess I, it's interesting to think about whether your ending there was uplifting or depressing. And I, I bet different people have different reads on it. Um, I personally found that really, really uplifting. Um, yeah. And I just wanna thank you. And I also want to um, mention before we go on that I was talking to Dave Cormier yesterday and he was kind of, he was kind of pissed at me that after his talk, I, I booted him right out. You know, I was like, leave Dave, you know, and then we processed for a little bit. But part of what I'm trying to do is that I, in thinking about what Nick was talking about with Jumpstart, 
I've really intentionally tried to compress the time so that it doesn't take up our full days. Um, so we could talk for a really long time about those ideas that Nick raised, and I hope that you do. Um, but I'm trying to free things up. So if you talk about those things, do it on your own time, you know, over a drink with a friend on Zoom. Um, this is not designed to be the end of the conversation, but I think in terms of our own self-preservation, keeping these morning sessions to an hour and a half is a way of protecting what is a little bit your, your free time. So um, I wanna put that out there as a way of explaining why we're not taking a lot more time to talk about the rich ideas in your presentation and also in the ones that we're about to hear. Um, so with that, I'm gonna end the recording and we will restart, so.